those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy, and blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name, and his mercy is for those who fear him. From generation to generation he has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent empty away. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her home. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you. And I don't know how those people at home, is it good to see me? But it's good to see all of you here. And uh, if you see me, I hope uh, I'll be a blessing to you. So, the peace of the Lord be with all those of you here gathered in Kampung Lapan and also all those scattered in Malacca and in whatever part of the world that you are watching this service. The theme that I propose for this season of Advent is creating expectations, creating expectations. Uh, Advent is an interesting period because it is a time of preparation, of waiting, of expectations. And it is to look forward to the arrival of the first king. And of course, as the Christian church rolled down and rolled on, we realize it is also to prepare them for the second coming of Christ. And the uh, Sometimes I've been asked, uh, well, in the beginning of the church, I had to make a decision of the whole Christian church calendar, right, right from where Mark has said, beginning with Advent, which is the, um, I think it's the last week of November, or in this case, uh, the first week of November, I think, eh, December. So we find that it's the start of a new year, and it runs through all the different phases of the life of Jesus until Pentecost, then it becomes to center on the church. And that is somewhere um, a way to lock the ground the average believer who in the early church, most of them, 95% of them are illiterate. And so using the calendar as a way to shape and form their Christian life was their, their only means. And when we first started out to think about what of this particular uh, feast or celebration should we go by? Of course, the easiest, of course, is to choose Christmas and also to then the biggest of all. I would think that is the uh, main highlight or focus of the Christian church has always been Easter. So it comes with Friday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday and uh, Easter Sunday. Now, I say all these things to help you understand that um, there will be people who find uh, one particular day of that kind of Christian calendar, maybe Christmas or other days, as something very um, uncomfortable because some of these feasts may sound like it looks uh, like it's tied to pagan festivals. And notwithstanding what, uh, whatever it is, the main task of anyone dealing with this calendar 
is to not so much talk about Christmas. As you will hear that the whole, whole so-called theme or central focus of this season is actually, when you come to uh, Christmas Day, I will tell you, it's the story of incarnation. The Word of God became flesh. That is the key. It's not whether got there's jingle bell in your departmental stores or not. That's not the point. And that's very hard for a uh, very much a, a urban society like ours where the message of the departmental store over the loudspeaker is louder than what the pastor can tell. So we are fighting a losing battle and we have to constantly keep this idea before the people of God that it is incarnation that we are interested in. It's the most difficult part to explain. It's the most difficult part for people to think about. Athanasius, the, one of the uh, big church, uh, early, early church fathers, has uh, written a whole book on the incarnation, and yet many people don't know what the, incarnation other, uh, what the incarnation is other than the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Oh, inside there is all of the gospel that you ever need to know. Anyway, that's to say that because uh, if you feel uncomfortable, then one of the things to remember is we are trying to talk about the main central thing of how the early Christian church look at it, okay? It's not just because yesterday we all start to decide, celebrate Christmas and take in the Christmas tree and all the other things that go with Christmas. Enough. And so we talk about creating expectations. So this is to tell us to create an expectation for the Lord, the Lord's coming always bring blessings. The Lord's coming always bring good things for us. And if Jesus, who is the, a good person, a great person, a loving God, can come to us more, actually we will look forward to, this, to His arrival, both in our life and also in our church as well. This... Um, so-called decorative piece that you see on the screen is uh, the text there is from the Magnificat. I get it right. Magnificat. <laughs> M-A-G-N-I-F-I-C-A-T. It comes from the Latin word uh, where they translate my soul magnifies the Lord. So that's where it's coming from. And the whole text is there. What you have read from the Bible passage is actually consisting of two parts. One is the visit of Mary to Elizabeth, a cousin. And the second half of it is actually the, the song that Mary sang. And it's called, that's why I have titled today's sermon as the Song of Mary. And this particular text, the Magnificat, the text itself, is found in the real in the church. In somewhere in Jerusalem, eh, no, in Israel, in a village called Ian Karim or somewhere like that. A small village where they, they think that that is the place where this uh, meeting of uh, Mary and Elizabeth took place. And they build a church there. Of course, they get a statue there. Uh, one of them is Mary, one of them is Elizabeth. So if you can guess, there's a pregnant woman there, that would be the Elizabeth. She's much older and Mary is, I mean, there's a big gap in their ages. And interesting, and in this meeting, you will find that one is an old woman who had, whose womb was dead and was resurrected. And the other one, the other person there is Mary, young, virgin, and yet they have, she has a baby in her womb. And two babies that are not possible to be present are present in these two people's lives, and they all come together. And in this church, there's a wall, and as you can see behind that statue there, there are 40, 42 such, uh, what you call, decorative uh, pieces. And each one of them is the song of Magnificat. And each one of them is done in uh, four, 42 different languages. Just to tell you, it's a universal song for everybody to learn. 
So how does God use this song to help us create expectations? I think the first thing is to realize that this song was birthed or created in the context of fellowship. It is she, Mary, who came down to visit uh, Elizabeth. And you think that they live next door to each other. No. They, to go down to see Elizabeth, Mary had to travel four days. So it's a very long journey. And there's a lot of preparation because we also know that, that she, Mary, stayed in Elizabeth's house for three months. And the distance and the journey that she covered would likely have robbers and there are dangers on the highway there. And so it's very likely that she did not travel alone, but that she had uh, some men to accompany. And once they've deposited her in Elizabeth's house, this man probably gone back home. But these are all the different things that go on that we can speculate. Bible is silent, but it's most likely to happen. And why did she go there? Because of what the angel said to Mary. He said, your cousin, your relative Elizabeth, is in her old age and has conceived a son. She's now six months pregnant. So she felt that maybe she will go there to encourage. I think if we come to fellowship, maybe in a church service, maybe it's not so, um, uh, so obvious. But when we are together in informal gatherings, if we come with an attitude to encourage, then it will be a very powerful time of gathering. And this is what, because of what the angel saying that your cousin, they, she decided to make the visit. So the writer of the gospel, Luke, joins the lives of Mary, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Elizabeth's baby, which is uh, John, and Jesus, whom Mary is carrying. And they the writer kind of bring all of them together. And this is a fellowship combining visible people and invisible people. The babies are in the womb, you can't see. And it's a kind of a picture that Christian fellowship always has the element of God. You now you say you hear the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. God has called us into the fellowship of the Son. So fellowship is... Uh, it's a Godward dimension, or in this case here, these invisible beings represent, uh, at least Jesus will represent God the Son. And there's this kind of mix of natural and supernatural things going on together that makes the, uh, the fellowship so enriching. So now you see in this uh, coming together, first Mary's greeting uh, inspired or sparked off some fire in Elizabeth, the child leaped for joy at the sound of her greeting, the Bible tells us. And then Elizabeth acknowledged that she is the mother of our, my, the mother of our Lord. That is a very significant thing. It's the only time you read in the New Testament, uh, I mean, in this, uh, uh, rarely is this term used, but to call her mother of the Lord, it's kind of like acknowledging her status in this particular whole story of the birth of Jesus. And then, of course, then Mary greets, Elizabeth greets Mary with a lot of, three times she mentioned the word blessed, blessed, blessed. And it's a kind of a blessing that is going on in this kind of fellowship. And that sets up the setting for Mary to sing her song. So without going any more, it's just to tell you that Christian fellowship has to, I mean, Christian fellowship naturally bring about blessing. You, you will find that Mary even in chapter 1 verse 42, she pronounced herself blessed. She said, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. The baby in her womb was pronounced blessed. And second time, Mary was called blessed again by Elizabeth. And you find these words jumping off the page. You should catch your notice because it's so significant that we all must know that God is very interested to bless us. Don't think that God does not want to bless us. 
and especially in the context of our coming together, formally or in the, or in the, in the service, it is to bless. And, and, and we could say that, you know, uh, if we could all just say one key word of uh, all Christian fellowship, it's blessed, 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 blessed. I bless you, God bless you, you bless me, and I'm blessed forever, and so on. That kind of theme must be kind of prevalent in the Christian fellowship. Don't ever, ever think lightly of God's desire to bless you. God really wants to bless you. You know, I have been drawn a lot to the Psalms. How it came about was over a period of three days, on two, two times from the state of sleep to the state of rising, I heard someone recited, recited Psalm 1. The third is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, and so on, so on, so on. And by the time I wake up fully, you know, I've heard the verse 6 being read to me. Twice it happened. And that started on a journey to read as much Psalms as possible. And I found that many people have gone far ahead in the whole area of reading Psalms. Uh, modern people, old people, you don't need to be a monk. The monk recite the psalms, uh, one, the whole 150 psalms in one week. But, you know, as you go into the psalms, you find how rich it is to give you a voice to express whatever state you are in, from being down in the dumps, from being angry even, from being blessed on the top of the mountain, being in the valley, facing death, facing the, uh, and experiencing the, the rescue of the Lord, the salvation of the Lord, the redemption of the Lord, and all this kind of, all put together. And it tells you something that uh, the psalm is basically given to us so that we may lead a more complete life rather than we all want to find good things in life only. Yes, God wants to bless you still. But it's within the context of a very, very tough life that we live in. And we've got to recognize both. There's the blessing of the Lord and the circumstances that surround us that sometimes do not give us the indication that God wants to bless us. And someone, if you just take two words there, blessed. Why is the first word of this important prayer book of Jesus? The Psalms are called the, is called the prayer book of Jesus. Why is this psalm book start with this word, blessed? It's because really, really God thinks the first thing you should know is that He's a blessing God. And who get blessed? Not the Trinity, not the Father, not the Son, not the Holy Spirit, not the angels. The man. Uh, the man. The man who ever walk in his way. The man who ever take up the book of, bless, of Psalms and read it thoroughly. He is that man that he's interested in. He's that man that he wants to bless and bless and bless and bless. How many times I do not know. That's the thing here. you have to understand. That it is not a fluke, uh, what you call a random idea. He got up one morning feeling good and he said, bless. No, right from the beginning of eternity, it was his heart to bless you. If you read what he has to tell you, through the Psalms. So you cannot imagine how much is in the mind of God, how strong is His desire to bless you so much. I'm sure all Christian, all Christian fellowship should have a mark of that, of being blessed by God. And the whole story of uh, Mary and the song there indicate to us that we, I will say in summary, invite all of us to join the story of God. Okay? Because God has a story. God's story is broken up into six parts. That means it's a summary of the whole Bible. People are beginning to realize that if you read fragments of the Bible, you will never, never be grounded in the real thing of the gospel. The gospel is just a good story, a good news story. But if you hear a bit here, maybe David, I mean, David and Goliath's story, and then you hear another one, Zechariah's story, all these are pieces of story, but they're all part 
of a big, big story called the story of God. And we can summarize them in this way. Many, many uh, Bible teachers are beginning to be aware why Christians are not so fluent or literate with the Bible. They call it Bible literacy. How well you know the Bible. Because we hear the stories as a, a collection of stories. We don't know whether head or tail. So they urge Christians to understand the big, big story. And not only that, as you tell the big, big story, invite people into God's story. Don't just listen and hear the story and nothing to do with that story. God's plan is to tell you His story so that you can join in His story. That is the basic message of the Bible. And after all, stories are very nice, right? You prefer to hear a pastor who tells story after one another. I was like that. But then, of course, what kind of stories? People remember the stories more than the sermon. One lady said to me, Pastor, in three days of camp I had with you, I have laughed more than all my entire life in the church. Well, I tell funny stories. Lah. But the point is, People remember stories. God's, the, the rabbis say it like that. After all said and done, all we have is a story. That's all. That's a story of God. That's a story of God who loves His people. And the Lord of God who will come in to rescue us when we are in trouble. So the big story, I uh, unpack that for you. The beginning of the world. That's between, in Genesis 1 and 2. By the way, that is not the only passage. I'm trying to follow them as it appears in the Bible. So you have Genesis here. The beginning of the world. Genesis 1, 2. Then Genesis 3 is the rebellion of man. And it's not just one man rebelling. He was our, as we will say, our federal head. The Adamic man represented us in the garden. When he rebelled against God, the whole human race rebelled against God. And there was something left in us that made us all the time lean towards rebelling against God. And this is this man's rebellion that stands uh, in the way of man coming back to God and God has to deal, deal with it. So he created a plan. He had a concept. He had an idea. And now we are beginning to understand that God has an idea of each one of us in eternity. Don't think that God forgets you, no. He started out, if ever you can say that God has a beginning, God started out thinking about us. So He has this idea now. He wants to rescue us. So using the, using, uh, the nation of Israel as an incubator, to develop the three main things that he wants to convey to us, that the man that will come to rescue, or the person that will come to rescue, the servant of the Lord, he has these elements of being a king, a prophet, and a priest. It's all laid out for in your God, in your Bible. So he first chose a man. This is Genesis 12. And right until the end of Malachi, he is repetitively showing this is a good king. This is how a, a greater king will come that will be better than this. This is a bad king. This good king that I've promised to you won't be like that. This is a bad prophet. This is a good prophet. This is a good priest. And this is a bad priest. All the way through to educate them, to create and form in their mind an understanding of what this man will be. True, there can be some parts that they misinterpreted. There are some parts in which they don't quite get it clear. Sometimes they mistook and uh, misunderstand what God said, but generally the whole thrust is there's a king, there's a priest, eh, there's a king, there's a prophet, and there's a priest. Are all embedded in that whole long story of the Old Testament. That's why your Old Testament has history, which is basically talking about the kings. And then he has these psalms or these uh, poems or poetry, which is uh, uh, a part of their uh, wisdom. Uh, we call them the wisdom literature to make people wise through uh, the priest teaching these people what should be, it should be. And then, of course, there's a whole range of the prophets, major prophets, right up to the 12 minor prophets of your Old Testament. It ends there. Okay, enough of that. But just to give you an idea that God 
patiently teach man, his people, through the family of Abraham, teaching them step by step to get them to have an idea. When the man comes to rescue, the king comes to rescue, you will at least know how to recognize him. And then the fourth part, of course, the coming of the king, which is all in the four Gospels. And you must understand that gospel is not biography. In some sense, it is a biography. But biography don't spend one third of their length of the biography about the person's death, right? A biography tell of his great deeds, what he, uh, what he can do, what he, whatever, how he started his life, what education he went through, who he married, and so on. But this biography is very interesting. One third of that whole biography, each of these four men's biography, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all concentrate the last part and devoted a large chunk of that biography to his death. Very good fun. Your hero, the man in the hero in the biography ended up dead on the cross. There yeah, he was brought down. Yeah, there was a very short section. He said that they say that he rose again from the dead. But all that does not fit into the idea of a biography. It's properly called gospel. The original meaning of gospel is good news. This is the good news. And this good news is very strange. He, he's all-powerful. The story of Mark's gospel is indicative of what he's trying to say. They saw the, he saw the man lowered down by four friends onto the floor, from the roof. Now they punch a hole through the roof, let down the, the, the sick man. The first thing he said, this is if you go by Mark's story, Mark's gospel, the first thing he said was, your sins are forgiven. All of them got very upset. Why? They said, only God can forgive sins. That's one problem. Right? And here you have this man claiming he can forgive sin. But I say, hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah, I, I am all powerful. He said, get up, rise up, and heal the man. It's a strange, if you are a, someone who wants to come in as a hero, you do heroic things, boom, heal him first. Correct? That's what men expected. But this, 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 this Jesus, this Son of God, in terms of power, he was so restrained. In terms of authority, he was very restrained. I remember Edward Miller saying like this in some of the healing meetings. He said, you can feel the power of God. He said, God's all-powerful. Zap into a man's body. Can just heal that small little cancer in him. And why didn't burn his, fry his brain? Why didn't numb all his left side of his body? No, this, 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 this power got very intelligent, very well controlled one. It just shook and hit only the cancer. Why? God's all powerful. Let go all the power. Boom. You see, but everybody will be fried. But the power of God is very powerful. You know, I always think about Auntie Isabel. My children say, Auntie is a bell. She came for the healing meeting. She said, I can't see. Lay hands on her. Only one eye opened. The other eye didn't open. I have uh, from time to time cracked my head. Why God? Uh, you come now with all that power, only one eye. Funny, huh? You say, why don't heal two eyes? I don't know. This is something that I keep on saying that he's all powerful, but the, the picture, the portrait that Mark gives is always someone very restrained and that's willing to go to the cross without using that power to come down at the last part. He got to show that to them. It's so easy to mistake this king that's coming who can call a legion of soldiers and whack everybody off. Very easy. He said that in John's Gospel. But he keep on restraining his power. Very strange. And that's the thing that we have to know. Why this Son of God, which is explained in Philippians chapter 2, right? He did not count equality with God, something to be grasped. 
He came in the form of man. He came to serve and finally to obey God and die on the cross. This is the kind of king you have. Who will then let God then raise him up? That at the name of Jesus, every knee in heaven, on earth, and under the earth will bow to the glory of God the Father. This is a very strange God who go down in order to go up. And this is a strange God who can do so many things possible for himself, but he did not choose to do it for himself. You know, he also came to do one thing, no? to show you his father. We all find three times in the Bible the word Abba. Abba is just the Aramaic word for father. Two times he appears in the gospel, uh, in the episodes by Paul, Romans and Galatians. But the first time it was used, if we follow the story, it came from Mark. And a lot of Christians have this funny idea. Abba, Father, means everything will be all right. You need to know God as your Father. In some very trying times, where did He call God Abba, Father? In the Garden of Gethsemane. He can still call God Father. If you are in a situation, half of Garden and Garden of Gethsemane's agony, we all trouble, we all forget that. Yeah, yeah, God is never a father. He can send me to this Gethsemane. He wants to show you a very simple thing. In the midst of your most difficult situation, God is still father for you. You think, you think he will come and lift him up with 10,000 angels out of the garden of Gethsemane and spare him of the cross? Mark, don't want you to know that. Mark wants you to know of a man who will stick to it all the way through and hang on the cross without using his power to come down. Strange, strange God. Oh, yeah, I got, got carried away. This, this is just to show you he's all-powerful. And every time we think of that, it is his revelation of who God is to you, God as Father. And then also the other thing is, Every time we tell this gospel story, this is number four, the coming of the Lord. And even up to the letters to the churches, there is another side call, which is a huge call, is to invite you to join his story. From this point onwards, at the fourth, we call it six chapters of a book, big six chapters of a story, at this fourth chapter, the door opens for everybody. And there's a sound telling you, when I tell you this story, come, I invite you to join the story. That must be held together. It's not just to learn the story, but it's to learn the story so you can jump in and join the story after that. The calling of the church, how the church is formed, and finally, the return of the king which is found in the all, all, number 5, chapter 5, is all in the book of Acts and episodes, the last episode being Jude. And then number 6 is the return of the king. I have string for you what the whole Bible story is about. It's one story. It's not many, many, uh, King David, or King Nebuchadnezzar, this and that. No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, they're all sub, 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 sub story. But the main story is one story. And keep that in mind. Then hopefully, as you learn things, you know where to slot them. As your own biblical education goes on, you get still one story. But as you grow more and more and study the Bible, read the Bible, you are fleshing out more of what the substance of the story. You cannot tell God's big story. I have done it eh, in, within a sermon. But you know how long it takes to put that all together. And it's voluminous. That means there's a lot of words to say. But still one big, big story. So always, whether it's a long-form story or short-form story, there is a call, hey, come and join this story. It's a story that involves you and me. His story is his story, okay? And we can change the story of our life to join his story. 
You should be very excited about that, right? This is what the gospel of Jesus Christ is. That's why he, she sang. How do I get it? He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. When Mary stood there and sang a song, she is singing not only of all the good things that God has done for him, but she ground her story according to another story that's going on in the Old Testament. What God said to Abraham, just Genesis 12, and how he built up the story. He, she is saying, what is happening to me? The wonderful thing about what, that I'm a part of God's story. I'm locked or I'm grounded. I'm linked to that old story found in Genesis chapter 12, right until Malachi, until, the God, uh, until chapter 5, uh, after what I've just said. Hey, chapter 4, what is it? Hey, yeah. So I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of wanting you to see that she never, never tell her story. She never sing her song. It's a significant part of the song. Sorry, she is the mother of the Lord. Where does it all come in? It's all according to a story or part of a bigger story that God was telling people and she jumped into the bandwagon, we can say. Jump into the story and begin her, own, begin her life with that story. You see, Mary was a poor village girl. So the best of her understanding and our understanding, she will most likely be like any other woman in Israel, in her village. She will grow up looking after one child or many children, definitely many children as well. Now, some of them are not her children. Some of them could be Joseph's children. It is said that um, she remained a virgin for the rest of her life. That is the Eastern Orthodox view. Now, you take it or leave it, it doesn't matter. But they are arguing from silence, okay? You can't say that for sure. Did she have other children after, Mary, after Jesus? Hard to tell, okay? Let's just put it that way. And we are told that he, she has brothers. So her, her uh, Jesus had brothers. So that means Mary had children. It could be Joseph's children because the story, the story is likely that Joseph was a widower with children from the first marriage. And in those days, a man cannot be, leave, be left unmarried because if you have to work, you have to somebody to look after the house. So marriage was not romantic love and fall in love. No, 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 no. It's a very pragmatic, utilitarian business, you know. If I got no wife, I got no worker in the house. I got to get married. So that was all that's in these dealings that they have. And so, yeah, he got married. Mary, Mary. She, he married Mary. Okay. So she will end up with her life cooking, washing, cleaning house, probably for the rest of her life. Nothing significant in her life. So when God's word came to her through the angel Gabriel, she found herself facing a door. Right, an open door to join in God's story. And it's a huge door before her. And she agreed. Let it be done to me according to your word, she said like that. So she entered into the story. That's why when she sang, all oh, this is happening to me, according, I'm using a new RSV, ESV doesn't use the word according, According to the promise he made to our ancestors, Abraham, I am part of a long, long old story that goes back all the way to Genesis chapter 12. That's how far back he went. And that is where she went right in and changed her story. He said, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. Wonderful words. She accepted God's story as a story. She won't tell her story. Her story is going to be one of a housewife, homemaker, looking after children, cooking and making home. But she said, I'm more than that. I am part of a big story that God invited me to join in. And yes, I will join in, she said. 
you must use the word, you must remember the word according more and more. According means by way of this means. Eh? Abraham believed, hoping against hope so that he can become the father of many nations. According. Maybe all of us say it together. According. According. Not accordion. According. So we follow a life according. Something that is tracking us, that is the controlling factor for us. That is controlling the story. We are not controlling the story. God or someone else is controlling the story for us. What He has spoken to our descendants. Look at this verse, Philippians 4.19. And my God will supply all your needs according to His riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Oh brother, you don't talk about what, what is running your, your, your money story. Ah, they, this is where he's saying, Paul is saying, I am following a story according to God. And God's riches is unending. God is the supplier. He has a thousand channels to bless me with. It's a vast supply. Enough for everyone and more. More than enough. And stable, consistent, undiminished. Every time God supplies you, He's not poorer. Very strange. I give you money, I'll be poorer. God give you all this money, He's not poor. He'll never be poor. This is the supply you are grounded in, you are connected in. We are, if you say, I am going to be like this, like this, according to His promises, according to His supply, according to His story, you will be a blessed person all the way through. This is a very famous film, Saving Private Ryan. Who have seen this film? Very few people. So I'm, uh, I'm the only rascal uh, who watch films. I watch it a few times. It's uh, done by the director Spielberg. And it's meant to be an anti-war film. In order to stop wars, he created a war movie. Okay? In this story, it's about four brothers who went out to war in the Second World War. By the time of the story, three brothers had died. <laughs> and only one was still alive. So the army did, but the army did not know where this last remaining brother is. The name of the bro that brother is Private James Ryan. Okay? So this surviving brother was still alive, but they do not they do not know where he was. So the top brass of the army out of concern for these four brothers' mother, decided to, decided to find this fourth surviving brother, locate him, take him home, so that the mother do not have to grieve for four sons. Somehow the army thinks that grieving for three sons is easier than grieving for four sons. It has some logic there. But one son also tak boleh tahan. No? Three sons already bare. No? Four sons. So they were trying to spare her the grief. Must be a terrible grief. So the top brass, right, all the way to the few to the general there. They appointed this Captain John Miller. That's the man you see, handsome man, Tom Hanks. They told him, get a squad of soldiers. Go, we roughly know, he was a paratrooper. He was parachuted down into an area, but they cannot locate that area. Behind enemy lines. The word behind enemy lines means, you know, when two armies fight, uh, behind here, the enemy here, this, 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 this area here is called the enemy's line. 
So it's a very tough uh, journey to get through to find this man and bring him home. Bring him home. So they know that he, Private Ryan was dropped into an area behind enemy lines, dangerous lines. So this is a squad that was formed. I think there are two other men there, not there. I cannot find the picture to get all the people there. So there's one more picture, one more man at least that's not there. So they had to go through very dangerous territory to, find, to fight against the Germans and find this private Ryan. Of course, along the way, the squad met up with many and, and many dangerous situations, fighting with tanks and uh, fighting with German machine guns and so on. And in the process, they lost, I think, one. But sometimes I, can, I cannot, cannot count properly, I think. In a movie, you don't count everyone there. But I think it could be two soldiers in the squad who died. So let's just take it as two, okay? I'm not so sure. And so, as they walk, they also complain, this squad. One of them will say like this, this is meaningless. La. We sent eight men to go and look for one man so that he can go home. And now two men died to get one man. Where got meaning? La? So they are very frustrated. Complain, complain, complain all the way. They grumble, grumble, grumble. No peace for the captain. Of course, the captain, Tom Hanks, uh, the actor, he was very cool. So one day, one time they said to him, we complain to you, we complain to you. Who do you complain? I complain to my higher up. La. I don't complain to you. And he keep walking. One man said, why is private Ryan so important? We not important, meh? Ah, something like that, they were talking. Then one fellow said, this is all over the, here and there over the movie. Yeah? So I just tell you. Uh, one man said, oh, you mean only Ryan's mother wants private Ryan to go home? Ah? You think only Mrs. Ryan wants to go home? My mother also wants me to go home. Why don't they go and bring a whole squad of people to take me home? So they argue like that. Lah. I also want to go home. My mother also wants me to go home. So why is he so special? So one time, one of them got so frustrated with the mission, he keep on, he, at that time, maybe the second man had died already. Then he said he wants to go and walk back to the base. He was going to go back home. Home, not the American home. The home that, where the, 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 the army was camped in. I want to go back. I want to walk back. The other soldier pull out the pistol and point at him. You go back. I'll shoot you. Oh, yo. So they were fighting among themselves now. So horrible. So after many trials and temptations, they finally met Private James Ryan. They go on part. They found the wrong Private Ryan. There are many Ryans in the army. And they'd interview him, try to pretend sad, 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 and then found out, you're wrong, man. So they were very frustrated as well. So finally, they found the real private James Ryan. And this James Ryan was deep inside enemy territory, and he was with a small group of men who, they got lost in the way, they parachuted in the wrong place. And when they found themselves at that wrong place, they discovered they were in a village which had a bridge. And this bridge, they realize, is very important in two ways. If they could keep this bridge intact, then when the American soldiers rode in, they got a bridge to cross over this and move, advance further, right? But they also realize they are a very small force and the Germans are coming through their territory to come into the bridge. And they had this plan. If the Americans don't come first, we're going to bomb that bridge. That was their plan. And they were so small, how to fight this onslaught of tanks and machine gunners and so on. But they, that's what their plan is. And so Private Rand said, look, Captain Miller and said, I can't go back home. We are holding a very strategic uh, bridge in this war. If we can hold it, it can turn the tide of the war. We can advance into Berlin faster. And if we let the Germans use this bridge, our soldiers will be massacred. We have to bomb. It's an important job. I can't go back. All the squad members of Captain Miller got angry. Look, now we come here all this way to rescue you. Now you don't want to go home and they go on, go on like that. Now. You would, what, if you're one of the squad. We all went through fire and hell to get you. Now you don't want to go home. Mm. 
it make them boiling mad even. So, in a, after everything, they have accepted that Private Ryan won't go back. One of the sergeant and Captain Miller were talking. And this sergeant say something like this. Huh? He said, maybe he told the he told the captain. The sergeant said to the captain, maybe lah. In all this madness of war, now he did not use the name God, huh? But he has the word God there, lah, huh? Okay? And I checked the original script. You can find the script of this story that was used in the movie. I can't find out exact words he used. But he mentioned God. So let's just assume God or no God, he, there's a word God there. Lah. So I will paraphrase what he said. He said, maybe for some unexplained reason, maybe this whole messed up mission that we are in, God may have brought us here for a better purpose than rescue a, bro- uh, uh, rescue a soldier. Maybe we are supposed to stay back with Private Ryan and join the battle and increase the number of men that can defend this bridge. So that, and he said, if we win it, we reserve, we, we deserve the right to go home, the sergeant said to him. If not, we die, die lah here. <laughs> Something like that. Ah, it makes sense to the captain. Yeah. See what he's doing? He's changing his story. He's changing the general's story. The general's story was go and get Private Ryan. But suddenly in the situation that Private Ryan is in, it's a different story. Private Ryan don't want to go home. So they changed the story and joined a more noble one because now it makes sense. Eight men to rescue one man makes no sense. Meaningless, fighting with one another. Frustration all the way, grumbling all the way. Now this one, the school squad got a meaning in life now. Got a meaning in their mission. They can stay, they can fight, die, never mind. We, we all deserve the right to go home. Better still, a better story is there for them. And they had the kind of a bit of a cow sense to change their story. Enjoy a better story. And inside there is the whole encapsulation of what the gospel is about. We tell people God's story all the time. To tell them, oi, we got a better story all your, all your life. Because without meaning in life, without meaning in your mission, you will grumble, you don't know what you want. When people are very free, they fight all the time. When people are un- unhappy, they get angry. All sorts of things go on when you don't have a stable sense of what it means in life. And the gospel gives you a meaning and a purpose in life that can never be changed by circumstances. Day in, day out, season in, season out, year in, year out. The gospel's mission is still the same. God wants to love you as His Father. That's all. And we can tell people this good news, isn't it? Which nothing can change. Every other story of man's life are small stories and insignificant story. And you can change it to join God's story, God's grand story that will end up in Revelation. Oh, wait till I get to Revelation, friends. That will make my blood sing. It's fantastic when you hear God's story. How wonderful this story is. And we can, that's why Brother Ken used that song song about story. It's a wonderful story. Join the story. It invites you to this story. It's more meaningful. It's more honorable. They have found that if people do not have a meaning in life, really, really, they are wasting their life. They know that. And only God can give us an abiding purpose in life that will never change. Some of the things I am telling you, you heard it before already. But it goes to say that the story never changes, never changes. And the meaning in life never changes. 
you still to find what is God's calling for you, get on with it and do it. In 1842, this man's name is very hard to pronounce. Let us try it together. <laughs> I will get it wrong. Ifim Garasimovich Gluknikin. Okay, it's a Russian name. In 1982, let's call him Efim, was born in Oblast, Russia. The Tsar of Russia. At that time, all the, all the Jews and Christians to move to Armenia. You know what's Armenia? Recently, it was formed, but for many years, you don't read about Armenia. Except when you go to Singapore, you will see Armenian Street. And then there is an Armenian church there. But you ask people, where is Armenia? Most people do not know where it is. Okay? Never mind where it is. In 1850, in Armenia, Ephim received many visions and messages from God. The local people call him the boy prophet. His message and visions from God, he said to the Christians, God said that you all will be persecuted. Actually, you don't need God to tell you. It's in the Bible already. And maybe you are also experiencing it already. So what's there anyone to tell you? But they, God has to tell them. And then God said, Ephim said that, God wanted you, God wanted the believers to flee Armenia, to leave Armenia. The boy drew a map of the escape path, escape route. They were not to go to a neighboring village or the next county or the next country. This boy was uneducated. He asked for pen and paper, and during the time when God gave him the vision, he copied the vision accurately in detail. And when he showed the map to them, to the people in his uh, family and to in his church, they realized it was a very detailed map. And after some of them have studied the map, they realized that God was telling them to go to America. But there will first be three signs to indicate when the time to flee, when the time to leave Armenia, first there will be spontaneous prayer and praise in the community. People will start to praise and pray, pray to, uh, praise and pray. And then there will be a very bright comet that will flash through Armenia. That will be the second sign. And the third sign, the message of many preachers will be, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. In 1902, all the three signs came to pass. And that was the beginning of the exodus of the Pentecostal Christians out from Armenia into America. And according to the map, they did not stop at the East Coast in New York City. They went further and further westward until they come to the state of California. And so because of the boy's prophet, the boy prophet's map, they chose California as the place to stop for them. Many stayed back in Armenia. And those who stayed back mocked and laughed at those who fled. But in 1914, 12 years later, the Turks, not the Russians, the Turks began a genocide. Genocide is to wipe out a whole race. They began a genocide of the Armenians and wiped out the Armenian race and culture. Today, Turkey chooses not to admit that they have done that. But 33 countries looking at the documents who say that that was a genocide. The estimated number of fatalities or deaths is about 600,000 to 1.5 million Armenians died there. Sad story. But you see a whole group of Christians chose to hear God's story and join God's story and end up safe. And many times they hear stories from back home of how, because the genocide was over, extended over a few years, they heard how their fellow citizens lost this and lost that, were sent on imprisonment. Some of them died due to a long, long march 
starvation, concentration camp, and a whole lot of cruel, cruel things that they did to this culture, to this race of people. And every time they hear news, they are so glad as they worship God. They were part of the Azusa Street Revival people. They joined the Azusa Street Revival people. And every time they praise God, they thank God so much that God gave them a way out to change their story. Otherwise, they will all be buried in Armenia. And one of them was the Shakarian family. And the grandson, the grandson of Shakarian family, his name is Dimos Shakarian, who is the founder of the Full Gospel Businessman International. That's their story. Good story. Good story to follow. Or for follow the old story and stay in Armenia and die there and massacred there with the rest of the people. Suppose one man, a Christian man, maybe he's not well taught in the Bible, about the Bible, went to see a fortune teller. The fortune teller said this to him, you will work in Kuala Lumpur, and then you, ni- you meet a nice pretty girl in your workplace, and you fall in love with this girl, and you marry this girl, And then along the way, you discover that this girl is the daughter of a multi-billionaire in Kuala Lumpur. Now he has two choices, right? One, to follow the fortune teller story, which will make him very, very rich and secure for many, many years to come. Or follow Jesus' story. You're not supposed to follow the, you're not supposed to consult a fortune teller. Right? I think anybody will be greatly tempted, right? Follow the fortune teller story, lah. Hope it turned out right. Right? Or, the Bible says, don't follow that. Follow me. Eh? How? Eh, I may not get the money, oh. Multi billion, oh. If the, if the old man die, at least I would have a few billion for spare change. You know what I mean? So that's what he's thinking, ah. Very tempting, right? And there are other false stories that are being told to you. Please don't believe them. Listen to the big story of God. You'll be safer. What Mary's song is simply saying, I choose to follow the big story of God. Join me, join me, join me. And I will say to you, that because you make a decision to follow the big story, that means everything cautimary. No. Every now and then, an alternative story will come out. And tell you, come la, come la, my story better than Jesus' story la. Come la, come la, join me la. I think you know what to do la. You have enough cow sense, enough Christian sense to know you don't do that, right? Let's think. Fortune tellers, how good are they? So they say, the palm readers can find what is called a lifeline in your palm, huh? That lifeline, the longer it is, it's called lifeline. Lah, because the longer it is, the longer you live. So a bunch of British researchers right, start to dig up all those graves and try to examine their age compared to their lifeline. And found all those dead people who died very young, all got very long lines. Tak boleh pake lah, to you. So you know, before you follow that kind of story, you hope lah, that the fortune story, fortune teller story will turn out true and nice and they live happily ever after. Well, it may not be that way. Oh, wait, wait, hold on. Jesus doesn't promise you like that. All you got to do is your blessedness finally is obeying him all the way through. As you see Jesus path, he went down in Philippians 2 and then he went up again. He died and he rose again. I was... I know my time is up. But I wanted to show you my, the story that I tell for baptism. You die, with, you die with him, you bury it with him, and you rise again with him. And then all life is left in the pond. And all you got to do is now that you have joined the Bible story. You have joined the big story of God. 
and you give every day, you have opportunities to follow that. You have opportunities where people entice you out of that story. Don't listen to those stories that entice you out of the story. Stay on with the Jesus story, the big story. It will all turn out better than those bunch of Christians, Armenian in California. Amen. I'm done. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for Jesus who opened the door, invite us to join his story. We hear echoes every day. Come, follow me. Come, follow me. And Lord, every miracle you did was to invite a relationship with us. Every saying, every teaching, every sermon you made was to create in our heart an invitation to join the story of God. And even your last words were all invitation for us. The last words on the cross were invitation for us to join your story. And you tell you, those people who followed you, go and tell the same story. Go to all the nations of the world and tell them of this story. Call them to come and join the story of God. And Lord, we, be, we are the people who have heard that call to join your story. We will keep on following your story. We know that we stand as people rooted in a very long tradition of story that has consistently proven to be reliable, workable, and life-giving. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. <clears throat>